Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to wait a couple of moments here to let everybody get on that wants to get on. I know there's a lot of uh, uh, a lot of questions coming in on how to watch, but the announcement itself just went live. So I'll uh, sit back and wait. Uh, I just want to make sure everyone can hear me and see me. It sounds like there's some messages coming in that some folks can't hear me. Make sure your speakers are turned up and your your uh, you should be able to see us. At least see me, excuse me. Thank you, Audrey. Emily, turn your volume up. All right, I think uh, without further ado, I think I'm gonna go ahead and get started here. I think there's, uh, there's plenty of folks that are on. I hope uh, that you guys are able to hear me. So let's start off by saying welcome and thanks for joining us. Unfortunately, we're meeting under these circumstances instead of a more positive uh, situation where we can, we can uh, we can laugh and enjoy ourselves, but we still have reasons to do that. Uh, I want to introduce the folks that have uh, been instrumental in creating this. So number one is Dr. Deb Abel. She's the president of the Academy of Doctors of Audiology. Dr. Natalie Phillips, she's the senior audiologist at Advanced Otolaryngology and Audiology. And without her help, uh, I don't think we could have uh, produced this content today uh, using this nice platform. Dr. Gail Whitelaw, she is the clinical associate professor from The Ohio State University. Dr. Craig Casper, he's the managing director of New York Hearing Doctors. Dr. Becky Kazmarski, she's the owner of uh, Kazmarski Hearing Services. Uh, Dr. Judy Hutch, she's the president of Oral Valley Audiology. Dr. Christopher Spankovich, who's the, excuse me, I'm gonna take a deep breath here before I read this one off. He's the Associate Professor and Vice Chair of Research in the Department of Otolaryngology and Communicative Sciences at the University of Mississippi. You're going to hear from a few of these folks uh, in a little bit, and a couple of them are here uh, to help with the Q&A later on and, and provide some more background. So it's important for us to create a disclaimer, and I think you know who we are, but it's important to know that we are not infectious disease specialists. We are not immunologists. We are not government uh, officials either, obviously. We are here as audiologists to help disseminate facts and information about what's happening in our world today and provide some uh, relevant content that you can use in your practices. We are not uh, advertising anything. We're not a company. Uh, we don't, we're not getting paid for this. Uh, the thing that we really want to get across first and foremost is to remain calm. Remain calm, cool, and collected. We are healthcare professionals. It is uh, important for all of us to show that we are in control of the situation as well. So we've seen an, unpre an unprecedented event in our personal and professional lives, and there's no roadmap. We can't follow some roadmap. We can't go back and say, well, let's look at the Spanish flu or SARS or MERS or some of those other viruses that have happened in the past and provide that as an example for us to use today. And that's why it's so uh, it's so confusing for a lot of people, and it's ever changing. Uh, stuff that we talk about today, by tonight or even tomorrow morning, some of the information may change. So please make sure that you are relying not on us 100%, but that you are relying on your state, your city, your county officials, 
your government officials, your national organizations, and we're gonna we're gonna share a little bit about that in just a moment, because those are the folks that are going to share content and information that is important to all of us. We also want to acknowledge our national organizations. So, pardon me, I'm gonna uh, I'm sure stumble through some of this, but uh, first, the Academy of Doctors of Audiology. I do want to highlight that they actually are having a uh, town hall tomorrow, and this is their website. You can go to audiologist.org. The town hall, if uh, I can share this, pardon me, the town hall, they have a registration link, and we have that registration link in, uh, pardon me, we have the registration link in the description of this Facebook Live. The town hall is for all audiologists. It's not just for ADA members. And uh, I believe that's at, uh, uh, you'll, you'll find that information in the link. I, I want to say it's 10 a.m. Pacific, but I'm sorry. I, I don't remember. Um, so that's uh, what we have going on tomorrow. Uh, some of you have seen that we also have the American Academy of Audiology. Dr. Catherine Palmer uh, shared a second video this morning. And we're going to go over what uh, she has gone over as well as an academy that represents audiologists. So you can go to audiology.org or you can visit uh, AAA's YouTube channel. I'm sure that those videos are there as well. Um, so I think first and foremost, or not first and foremost, but we really should go over what coronavirus is. And as healthcare professionals, I know we're not physicians, we're not biologists. However, it's important for us to know. Coronavirus is actually a general family of viruses. Uh, we also should specify that there is something called COVID-19, which you've also heard of, and there's and, and there, they are related, but but there is a difference. Coronavirus is what's known as a uh, zoonotic uh, uh, virus, which means that it transmits from animals to humans. And the thing about that is it can be bacteria, parasites, viruses. It happens when we mix things from animals. So certain animals have diseases and viruses that don't affect humans and vice versa. Humans have infections that don't affect animals. It's when there's a virus that can affect both, we call that a zoonotic uh, virus. So when we mix these together, it creates kind of an interesting strain. That current strain that we are dealing with is called COVID-19. So COVID-19, if you didn't know, is a strain of coronavirus. Um, You've seen coronavirus listed on your uh, infection wipes, your your Lysols and Clorox and all that, because coronavirus has been around for a long time. Some simple examples of coronavirus are SARS. Uh, you've heard of SARS. MERS is another one, the Middle Eastern one. So there are coronaviruses that have shown up in the past. Uh, COVID-19 is the newest one that started up uh, from Wuhan, China back in November. Uh, most common signs of infection, and, and by the way, all of this that I'm explaining to you is all information from either the World Health Organization, which you can find their information here, or the CDC, which you can also find this information here. Uh, I'm having way too much fun with this uh, program, so bear with me as I uh, uh, play around, but CDC, of course, and the, uh, the National Institute of Health also has information. The, uh, the most common uh, signs of infection are essentially respiratory systems, shortness of breath, breathing difficulties, but also fever and cough. Uh, more severe cases can lead to pneumonia, severe acute respiratory syndrome, kidney failure, and of course, even death. Uh, from the CDC, they have a guideline on who uh, is a more high risk uh, category of people. So I'm actually just gonna read this off because it is important for us to know who these folks are and you may realize why we are having this call today with you. Uh, older adults and people of any age who have serious underlying medical conditions may be at higher risk for more serious complications from COVID-19 and based on available information to date, those most at risk include people 65 years or older, people who live in a nursing home or long-term care facility, people of any age with the following underlying medical conditions, particularly those that are not well controlled, chronic lung disease or asthma, congestive heart failure or coronary artery disease, diabetes, neurologic conditions that weaken ability to cough, weakened immune system, chemotherapy or radiation for cancer, 
either current or even in the recent past. Sickle cell anemia, chronic kidney disease requiring dialysis, cirrhosis of the liver, a lack of spleen or one that does not uh, function correctly, uh, extreme obesity, somebody who has a body mass index over 40. And then finally, people who are pregnant. So this population of, of folks that fall into that category, they must stay home. They must stay home. So keep space between themselves and others. If they decide to go out, they must stay away from anyone who is sick. If they display symptoms, they should contact their physicians. There's a graph that I found on a website, and I, and I don't know if it's pronounced Vox or Vo, it's V-O-X. And essentially, we you've heard the term flatten the curve. And what flattening the curve means is, I'm trying to get this open here. What flattening the curve means is there is a limitation, there is a limitation to hospital resources and physician resources. And if we see a steep spike in cases that need treatment, especially with respirators, we're gonna see a run on hospitals and it's gonna be a big mess. So what flattening the curve really means is let's, let's reduce that big spike by practicing social distancing. Now, those of us that know graphs, if you look very closely, yeah, this, this uh, pink area that says cases without protective measures, it goes up very fast and it comes down very fast the cases with protective measures is a lot flatter. It does spread out a little bit longer. So even though we might see some positive results by flattening the curve, we should also be prepared that this might be a little bit of a longer case scenario, but it's something that we can uh, hopefully manage a little bit easier. Uh, as of this morning, uh, there have been over about 319,000 cases worldwide with 13,700 deaths. There is a silver lining. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a small silver lining, but that 96,000 have recovered. In the United States alone, we have uh, 27,000 cases, including 349 deaths. Uh, also, 170, uh, about 178 have recovered. Uh, we were listening in to Governor, Governor Cuomo this morning from New York, and the, the cases are rising. So it's not going to be uncommon for us to see some pretty steep uh, increases in numbers of folks that have it. So the recommended ways to prevent the spread are regular hand washing with antibacterial soap. You can sing whatever song you want to sing, 20 to 30 seconds. If you cough, cover your mouth and nose. If you sneeze, cover your mouth and nose. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth with unwashed hands and thoroughly cooking meat and eggs. You must realize that, you know, we, we've seen posts online of people that are going out to cars and meeting patients, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but you have to realize that coronavirus can still last on surfaces. So you have to wipe down every single surface often, and you wipe them down, you keep it wet, and let it air dry. So if you have patients who are coming into your office, you better be wiping down that door handle after every single patient that comes in. If they touch your counter, if they touch a pen, just realize that some of those things can still stay on those surfaces. So I wanna jump forward to maybe some positives. Um, and and, and uh, um, we're so uh, glad to have Dr. Spankovich here with us today. Uh, some possible cures and vaccine updates. Now, again, we are not here to spread any false news. Uh, the reality is there is some, uh, there are some studies that are showing that if we use a, a common drug called chloroquine, which is part of the quinine family, that we are seeing some results. Now, those studies that are showing these results aren't, aren't the fullest studies, and I'm not a research audiologist, so uh, bear with my semantics on on the on that part of it. But the the thing is that if we mix the chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine with azithromycin or a ZPAC, we're seeing some interesting cases. In fact, even just this morning, we were uh, I was on a, on a group call and we were talking about Africa. There's actually not a very big uh, spike in cases in the whole continent of Africa. Uh, the theory is that they're using these anti-malarial drugs like quinine. Uh, we, again, have to realize that these are not conclusive studies, but they are studies. The government is working very diligently to find a solution. Uh, so again, using those drugs, there's been discussion. I've also been uh, asking these questions. 
we know that there is possibly some ototoxic effects uh, of quinine or uh, chloroquine. So instead of me trying to be that expert, we've asked Dr. Spankovich to join us here. So I'm going to uh, see if I can bring him on here. Uh, I believe that's not working. So hello. Do, 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 do. There we go. There you can, are. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Perfect. All right. Very good. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, I am also far from uh, an expert on um, COVID-19, uh, um, nor am I an expert on quinine. Um, I do not do specific ototoxic research in quinine. Um, majority of my ototoxicity research is in cisplatin, um, though I am very familiar with different ototoxic agents um, and have looked further into um, quinine and some of its synthetic derivatives, such as um, uh, hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine as well and how they function um, and what their potential ototoxicity um, effects may be. Um, understand that there are other drugs as well that are being looked at um, for uh, mitigation of symptoms related to COVID-19. Uh, one such drug is an experimental drug that was developed for Ebola, um, remdesivir. Um, I do not know much about that agent. Um, I have not had an opportunity to really look into any um, ototoxic um, properties associated with that, but um, that'll be something that I, I plan to um, look into um, soon. Uh, I can give you some information though on um, quinine derivatives and, um, and, and how they may be something that may be beneficial um, for mitigation of symptoms. Uh, there was a, a study that was alluded to, and, and that is a study in, in France that was completed recently. It's a small sample size, but indeed they did demonstrate some benefit of um, chloroquine um, and chloroquine with um, azithromycin together in um, reducing uh, the viral load and um, evidence of the virus in individuals in a uh, faster fashion. Um, I've also heard, though, um, some uh, uh, anecdotal reports of that drug, um, re re Remdesivir, um, also in offering some protection. They're using that um, on some of the front lines with physicians that are interacting with some of these patients that have symptoms. And I've, I've just heard some anecdotal evidence of individuals saying they took that drug and they bounced back um, very quickly. Um, so again, different things that, that may be um, possible um, uh, uh, future treatments to, to help things until we can um, develop a vaccine. And obviously vaccines take a much longer time to develop, but when you have a global effort that exists right now, hopefully we can bypass some of those, um, those time frames and really accelerate the process to have something uh, available in the, in the next year. Uh, so let's get to um, uh, quinine and, and quinine alternatives. Uh, I'll give a little bit of history on quinine. I'm sure many of you read about quinine or, or received some information on it during your AED programs. Um, it's been used for, for, for many, many centuries. Um, it uh, uh, has also had a lot of work done on it to um, create alternative versions or synthetic versions of. Um, and these date back um, all the way back to uh, the 1800s attempts to synthesize quinine um, for other applications. Um, one of the uh, first uh, synthetic versions was called methylene blue. Uh, and oddly enough, um, if an individual took that drug um, back in the 1800s, uh, it would actually turn their skin blue. And so some of these quinine alternatives have actually been used um, for um, producing dyes that are used uh, commercially. Um, uh, quinacrine, um, or it's also called um, um, mepocrine or adabrine, um, was an additional alternative that was generated, um, but it also changed individual skins yellow. Uh, and so um, these were some of the issues with some of these early synthetic versions of quinine. Um, chloroquine came around in 1934, was developed by Bayer, and um, they actually removed a third ring off of the, um, off the molecule. And that third ring is what actually had the colorful, um, visible light absorption portion that would turn individuals' skin colors. And so um, when they removed that, it uh, no longer turned the individual skin color and so obviously was used as an anti-malarial drug um, during uh, World War II. Um, initially, when Bayer produced that, uh, it was actually um, 
uh, set aside to be uh, concerning for being too toxic for human consumption. But eventually that, that changed. Uh, the hyd hydroxychloroquine came along in 1950, and that simply is just adding a hydroxyl group, um, uh, an OH group. Um, but otherwise, it's very similar to chloroquine. Hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine both have slightly less ototoxic properties than quinine itself. But the known side effects include tinnitus, balance issues, hearing issues, and, and can also have seizures. Uh, specifically, what does quinine and, and these agents do to the inner ear? Um, there is some work that has looked at the specific mechanism that quinine has on the inner ear. Um, this has been performed in vitro and in vivo studies um, in isolated out outer hair cells as well as in animal models and in humans. Um, what has been identified is that it appears that the way that quinine works is that it is um, blocking a mechanoelectric transducer channels of the hair cells. And that's both for outer hair cells in, in, and inner hair cells. Essentially, quinine is a standard um, potassium channel blocker. And by blocking that potassium channel, it basically shuts off the um, potassium recycling pathway, diminishes the endococcal potential, which diminishes the driving force of potassium into the hair cell itself. And that can result then in the hearing loss. The one positive thing about all of this is that this tends to be transient. Uh, even with um, a prolonged use, it often is transient as well. So um, permanent hearing loss, particularly as related to hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine, is pretty low risk. Um, probably the greater risk is going to be for um, tinnitus uh, and potential um, uh, 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 tinnitus that uh, persists despite um, hearing actually returning back to normal. But then again, the tinnitus is quite often um, reversed as well. Uh, the severity of the effects, um, different studies have um, suggested that uh, the temporary threshold shift can be upwards over 50 dB of a, of a TTS. So it can be pretty significant. Um, when I was actually at Rush University uh, in Chicago as an AUD student, one of my AUD colleagues presented a case study where it was a young man that presented to the, um, the emergency room with a sudden um, severe bilateral hearing loss. Uh, and it turned out he overdosed on heroin. Now heroin has no other toxic properties, but heroin is quite often cut with quinine. And that individual actually ended up having a full recovery of, of his hearing. Um, so the effects of the quinine um, and the uh, quinine-based products such as chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, um, the effects tend to appear within hours. So that person would start to experience some level of decreased hearing and tinnitus fairly quickly. Um, but it also tends to recover pretty quickly once that drug has moved out of the individual system. Uh, concern that we may have, well, concern is warranted for inclusion of additional ototoxic medication. So azithromycin has some potential low level ototoxic properties, but studies that have looked at long-term use of azithromycin, these are recent studies from the past few years, have really demonstrated that it has almost no ototoxic effect. We don't know though if there's any synergistic effect between those two. Strangely enough, um, quinine has actually been used as an ototoprotectant. Um, because quinine can actually protect against some level of cisplatin-induced hearing loss as well as aminoglycoside-induced hearing loss um, because it's basically shutting down, shutting down the pathway somewhat. Um, quinine <laughs> also has some effect uh, in the striovascularis as well um, at the level of melanocytes. That is another role in which it's, it's basically affecting the potassium recycling pathway. Um, so what we want to consider, though, with these individuals is... Um, is there going to be high risk of, of hearing loss if things do eventually move forward with um, um, quinine-based uh, uh, products? Um, probably not a huge issue, but it should be something that patients and providers are made aware of that it might be a symptom that they experience, even if it is just transiently, to prepare them for that occurring. Um, as we all know, um, hearing loss and tinnitus, even if it's transient, can, can be overwhelming for an individual. So then being prepared to know that is a potential risk, knowing that also that more than likely that is going to recover with time um, will be important. So I'm putting together a little screening protocol that's basically very simple questions um, regarding um, their hearing at baseline and then any changes in hearing and, and balance and, and perception of tinnitus um, as they're being monitored on on the actual agent itself 
Um, I, I, I think all of us should um, reach out to our communities, um, make them work if, if, again, if this drug starts to move forward, to have materials available um, to provide uh, for um, uh, individuals on the front line um, delivering these medications, just so patients are aware of, of why this is happening or can happen, and that there are things that they can do to help them. So if they do develop tinnitus, well, here's some simple strategies to help with your tinnitus. Um, you know, uh, use of sound enrichment, uh, 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 getting active in something to uh, reduce your attention to the tinnitus, so on and so forth. Um, when it comes to the hearing loss, um, you know that there are communication strategies that can be utilized or consideration <clears throat> of um, uh, uh, any type of uh, app-based um, amplification product like Ear Machine, um, different things that they can consider utilizing during that period of time. Another thing I'd, I'd want to stress in that is um, there could be potential for increased risk for noise-induced pathology. We don't know that, but that is common with other ototoxic agents. And so um, for patients to um, uh, take care of themselves while they are on those drugs and, and mitigate any further risk for, for damage. Again, I'm not, I'm not sure what how um, these drugs will interact with other medications that individuals are on, if they're on furosemide, if they're on um, aminoglycosides. Um, again, there are other studies show that quinine protects against those things. So um, we'll, we'll have to see. That's all I got. All right, can you can you still hear me? I can. Okay, my, uh, my computer is semi-frozen here. So do you... Now you cut up. All right, and I, I I can't hear you. Can anyone hear? Still hear me? So I'll just answer a few of these questions on the side while hopefully things get reset up. Um, let's see here. So if we already have tinnitus, will exacerbate. It's potential that it could exacerbate tinnitus, but. Um, uh, if you already have it, or it could exacerbate a hearing loss that an individual already has. More than likely, though, those things would recover back to your usual baseline, and it doesn't mean that you can't rehabituate to um, different things. Um, let's see here. Would it be prudent for us to send out? Yes, um, I think it would be. I, I would hold off uh, until these drugs actually become active agents that are going to be utilized in, in, in treating um, individuals, and once that's determined, um, I think uh, having a handout would be very beneficial. Uh, I'm already working on one. Um, I just had a new, I didn't have it. My, my wife just had a new baby a few days ago. And so that's been um, causing a slight delay. Um, but uh, hopefully in the next few days, I'll be able to get my version of it done and then hopefully send it out for others to add to and edit. And maybe we can get um, uh, bigger names from uh, AAA and ADA and, and ASHA to all contribute to um, helping to uh, bring that forward. Uh, if other comorbidities, co comorbidities exist, is it going to have an effect? More than likely it can affect, um, particularly if there is any type of kidney issues that are gonna be involved in how well that drug is through the system, liver issues, again, age, dosage level, duration of use, these are all gonna be factors that could potentially alter um, risk for ototoxicity with the agent itself. And so um, we won't really have great answers on that until um, we get there. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, read those questions. Um, am, I, am I back on? You are back on. Okay, yes. sorry about that. I don't know, my computer just, uh, I'll hold my comments. Okay, we're back. Um, so I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear, but I, I'm assuming you answered that question on if, uh, if that'll be uh, published. So uh, awesome. I'm, I'm working on something. Good. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate it. And I'm sure everyone else appreciates it. Uh, this will be, um, if there are specific questions, you can keep asking on the comments there, guys. Uh, but we're going to move on here. Sorry about that little uh, little hiccup there. Again, thanks a lot, Dr. Spankovich. Uh, maybe I should have let him uh, continue speaking here. All right. Um, so one of the biggest questions that people have been asking is whether or not they should stay open or if they should close their clinics. And I think that's probably a lot of you are here to, to, to hear what we have to say about that. Um, 
and, and I think the, the 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 fundamental thing is that we keep hearing the term essential. What is an essential service? What is uh, who is an exempt clinic, uh, business? Things like that. Uh, the federal government, uh, the the coronavirus task force, and the CDC have set some guidelines and recommendations for employers about their businesses. However, to date, there is still no national lockdown for any business. So, uh, as a group, when we were talking before this started, we really want to make it very clear that you check with your city, your county, your state's orders, and really abide by those rules. I know just, I mean, minutes before we went on, Ohio uh, just went into, um, I think it was a shelter in place. Gail, can you nod your head if that's correct? Was that a shelter in place or a, it was it was a it was an order that they dictated. So some of these folks uh, or some of these places are really getting into strict orders. So you really want to abide by that. And there are plenty of websites. Your state, city, county should have a website available that has plenty of information. I know that our local uh, in Los Angeles, we have a website called corona-virus.la backslash FAQ that shows current stats. It has updated information and it shows what is the order from the from the government. Thank you, Audrey. It's a stay at home rule um, in Ohio. Uh, a lot of the local news channels that have broader national ties like Fox, ABC, CBS, et cetera, may also have sites designated from your city that are tied in with the national uh, information. So I took some information just straight from New York. Uh, the state of New York was declared a disaster zone, and they said 100% of non-essential workers must stay home. So what's an essential worker? Well, we uh, I, I pulled this straight off this website, and it said, in New York, uh, a, a list of essential workers are research and lab services, hospitals, walk-in uh, walk care health facilities, veterinary and animal health services, elder care, medical, wholesale, and distribution, home health care workers or aides, doctor and dentist offices, nursing homes or residential health care facilities or congregate care facilities, medical supplies, and equipment providers. Now, obviously, um, we they don't they do not specifically state audiology. They rarely do, right? So some of those criteria could be considered audiology. If you think a doctor and dentist office uh, encompasses uh, an audiologist, then that is your opinion. However, we have to realize that audiology is not considered a life critical profession. We do help provide or we provide services to help people hear alerts and the ability to walk without vertigo and things like that. However, we're not really considered an essential life sustaining profession. So should we continue seeing patients, you know, back to that fundamental question? Well, uh, this morning, uh, uh, a lot of you uh, saw Dr. Catherine Palmer's announcement. AAA is recommending that everyone close. And I think that solidifies what our stance as a collective is as well that if you haven't closed your clinics, you really should. And we know, trust me, we know there's a financial windfall that occurs when you close your business. But the, the reality is, you know, I was on a call today with a group of physicians, and these are urologists, cardiologists, otolaryngologists, uh, a bunch of physicians in Los Angeles. They've been shut for a week. And if you think that we're providing a much higher level of essential duty than a cardiologist, uh, I think I think we all ought to close. Okay, uh, they they understand how vital social distancing is. I think they also understand how vital social uh, excuse me how how imperative it is that we don't catch this. Uh, and after hearing them, uh, a couple of them tell me last week, even uh, even here in Los Angeles, we I changed my tune. I know that you may have seen that I was on one side of this conversation. I'm now on uh, another side of it, where I'm encouraging people to close their clinics as well. Uh, most of us do work with these high-risk populations, and as such, we have to follow the best practices in hygiene and sterilization. It is difficult, uh, almost impossible, to see a patient without, without touching them from six feet away. I, I was going to joke around, which I, I don't want to joke around today. I know most of you that know me know that I like to joke around. I was going to joke around and have one of those, you know, extending uh, poles and put an otoscope on the very end, but that that doesn't work. We can't do that. Uh, so there are some ways we can still help our patients. So if we look at both sides of the coin, if you feel like you have to stay open for whatever reason, as I've heard some clinics in the Midwest are doing, and I spoke to a couple of them this morning, and uh, they're they're going by their state guidelines, and that's fine. 
you must follow all the guidelines provided by the CDC and the NIH. You must display appropriate signage, including the symptoms of, of COVID-19 or even any uh, uh, cough, you know, uh, respiratory issues. Uh, you have to display something that goes over the risks of coming in, and you have to provide some other option for those patients, meaning what can they do besides coming into your office? There's much more. And again, I'm going to say it numerous times, refer to the guidelines provided by your government officials. You have to use gloves. You got to use appropriate masks. You can't just use any old mask. There are specific masks if you're going to go work with this high-risk population. You have to continue wiping down your counters, your desks, your chairs, the arms of your chairs, your keyboards, your mouse or your mice, your door handles. All the equipment has to be wiped down with appropriate wipes and you have to keep doing it all day long. It's not a let's do it in the morning and let's do it in the evening. Every single patient that comes in, you have to do this. We recommend, not we, I'm sorry, take that back. It is recommended that you remove magazines from your waiting room. You recommend, it's also recommended you uh, take away the coffee maker. Uh, any tangible uh, item that's in your waiting room that somebody may touch, you, you know, reduce that risk, take it away. Uh, I know here in our office, we took our uh, our magazines, our coffee maker, and anything that's movable or touchable, and then we're constantly wiping off that front counter. If somebody uses a pen to sign a HIPAA compliance form, we're telling them to keep the pen. Don't, don't give it back. Uh, many practices have adopted a drive-up system where the patient, family member, friend, caregiver, whoever, whoever brings a hearing aid or uh, comes to pick up supplies or something of that nature, they're calling from outside, the provider or staff member go out, they pick it up in a bag, they work on the device, and then they take it back out or they bring out the supplies, whatever needs to be done. But even in that situation, you still have to be very, very careful. That hearing aid is not a sterile device. So you put it into a container or in a Dixie cup or in a, in a box, you bring it into your office, you better wipe that down, and then you're going to work on that hearing aid. I know that audiology is not just hearing aids, but this is... Uh, uh, most of our population that's watching probably are working with hearing aids. Uh, we understand that this is not possible to do an epilim mover in a parking lot without touching patients, so this probably does not apply to vestibular patients. Uh, some are using teleaudiology. This is something a little bit newer. There's been rules about this. Uh, there's a, uh, a document. Uh, AAA has actually sent a letter to CMS uh, recently. So there's a lot with teleaudiology. There's a lot with telehealth you can still converse with your patients using a telehealth system. Some of the operating management systems, uh, I'm not gonna list anything here, but uh, you guys know the big ones. Uh, some of them have uh, um, teleaudiology built in where you can do a face-to-face -face conversation with your patients. Some hearing aid companies have features to allow you to program hearing aids from the safety and comfort of your own home and their home so that they don't have to leave, right? So this option keeps your patients, it keeps your staff, and it keeps, of course, you safe. Another option is video tutorials. Uh, you know, some of our uh, providers have done some videos recently. Uh, I actually had this uh, picture up, but I had to close it because it wouldn't stop playing. I'm sorry, but uh, Dr. Casper, who's on the on, on the live here, he's gonna you're gonna hear from him in a few moments. He has a YouTube channel which is NYHD New York Hearing Doctors NYHD Life, and on there they're doing videos that patients can have access to, and you can create this content too. And then if you want cr create a video, email blast your patients. It's something that's uh, that can be done, okay? So with all of this turmoil that's going on, one of the biggest issues that we are seeing is our students. So what happens with audiology students? What's happening with the future of our profession? These kids need to graduate on time. Um, I am not uh, a professor. I, I don't, you know, I, I, I know a lot about this. However, uh, someone knows more about it than I do. So I'm going to bring on Dr. Gail Whitelaw from The Ohio State University, and she's going to uh, talk to you guys. So let me see if I can get this right. Hi, Hi guys. Girl. I'm really excited to be here because I know that there's a lot of questions from the future of our profession. I've talked to so many students over the past couple of weeks, and they're very concerned. And so the thing I would ask all of you that are professionals, is to please be positive during this time. We're all gonna get through this together. However, for our students, there's a couple of things that are really of great concern. One of the first things that's of great concern for our students is how are they gonna get their hours and their experiences and how are they gonna live through this? And they will. Um, so I've got a couple of suggestions on that. 
they will get educated. And every, I've been on the phone with universities for the past two weeks, and most of us have a plan in place. But as Amit said earlier, we don't have a playbook for this. There's no playbook for what happens for clinical education in a pandemic. So we're kind of making it up as we go along. Um, so you know, if you've worked with Simu case, um, primarily for speech pathologists, but there are audiology cases on there. Um, telepractice is something that universities now can more easily do because for us to bill for it is not as critical. And for example, in the state of Ohio, we've been given approval to do semi or to do telepractice in ways we haven't before. Um, but I would also suggest to you guys that if you have any time right now that you'd like to share a case with the university, um, please contact the university or contact me and I'll help you make contact with universities because all of our teaching is going to be online. And in case you were um, questioning this, it's new to all of us. I teach three classes this semester and all of them are going online live tomorrow. Um, I'm excited about that because I miss our students, but it's a whole new ball game. So if any of you have um, the opportunity to share a really interesting case or something fun that you do in your practice and you wanna to talk to students about it, now is the time, we welcome you. Um, I also am concerned because some students don't seem to have a lot of support from their universities. Students are asking questions on Facebook, on Instagram, on all kinds of places. Um, and this is the time for you to encourage them if they come to you to reach out to their universities. If a university hasn't had a strong um, clinical placement role in the past, now's their time. And the other thing about that is we're trying to make sure that students are focused on looking at their, um, not necessarily hours, but on their, their ability to do certain skills. And so ours should matter less. We are hoping that our, our accreditors see this as a once in a lifetime experience. And I think it's a once in a lifetime experience. You know, we can all agree on that. But I think it's really very, very important for us to say, when this is moving through or is over, we're gonna go to our accreditors and we're gonna say, let's look at competencies that our students have and not worry so much about, for example, 1,820 hours. Um, I've been in contact a number of days so that we can look at um, the licensure board in Ohio, which is very progressive. And they've assured us that they know that this is an exceptional time and they will make some exceptions, particularly for looking at the timeline for application. Um, I wanna talk for a minute, just a minute about fourth years. And this is a really concerning time for our fourth years because, or externs as we may call them, um, because of the fact that they maybe have already been asked to leave this week or they may be finishing up this week. And it's emotional for them because they've become really attached to those places and to those patients. And it's concerning to them because in some cases it's financial. But I would encourage each and every one of you to know that um, being able to offer them something is fantastic. But all of our students that we've talked to see that the health and well-being of their patients and of them is and of you is really important to them. So um, they also recognize this is an exceptional time. Um, some of our fourth years have done some really creative things. Jill Caseworm posted something earlier on Facebook and it was fantastic about now's your time to be creative. And I have to commend some of our fourth year sites for being really creative with our students and giving me the opportunity both to earn experiences and also to continue to earn some money. Um, and so they're gonna be working from home, but doing outreach to patients and um, you know, answering emails and calling and seeing how patients are. So that's been fantastic. And I have to really commend our sites for doing that. Um, some of our sites, unfortunately, have had to terminate. And our university, um, because we, I think we are kind of forward thinking, um, we have decided that we're going to look at students' competencies, and if a student cannot go back at this point in time, they're not going to be required to. I do want to point out the last thing about this, which are students who are leaving on fourth years or externships in a little over a month. Some of our students start the end of April, as do students nationally, um, and they're very concerned. We've already had a student who's gotten an email saying, we don't think we can offer you something any longer. So it's very difficult, um, but I would encourage each and every one of you 
as you look at the future, which we know our future is going to be bright when we come through this, um, the fact that if you ha can offer a fourth year, even if you can't pay for it, um, it might be a great time to help you get back up and running and implement things you've thought about during this time. Um, this week, I was very fortunate for the student who received the email. Um, it's really unfortunate because she got this email, but we were able to get her several interviews during the week for places that still had fourth years open. So if you think you have the possibility of a fourth year, I would encourage you to go on to hear careers and say, hey, you know, when this is all over, our practice wasn't considering this before, but we could use an extra pair of hands because I think once we come back from this, we'll all be very busy. Um, I'm happy to think about, um, yeah, and somebody just posted, um, consider in incoming fourth years if they will forgo pay. I'm going to tell you that a lot of our fourth years nationally are very concerned right now, and a lot of universities are concerned about this, and I think it is a game changer. I think that we may see some places that um, where students previously wanted to be paid for the experience and now just really want the experience and to be able to continue their education. So um, thanks for your time. I'll wrap up and um, answer questions when we get to them. Thank you so much, Gail. So, um, you know, here in California, especially, we have a handful of new programs that have started and we don't, there are not enough sites. So if you are in California and you're watching, I think what Dr. Weiler just uh, talked about is, is, is critically important. Thank you, uh, Gail. Uh, we're going to be doing a Q and A in just a few minutes. We still have a couple more topics. I know we were planning on going for one hour, but I think we're definitely going to go over one hour. So, uh, the stress is not only for students. You know, this is a stressful time for all of us. Uh, one major aspect of how we move forward is how we are leading through crisis. Our teams are worried. You know, they're scared. Our staff are worried. They're scared. And a lot of our staff live paycheck to paycheck. And so, you know, it brings a lot of stress to a lot of people. And so to talk uh, more about this and to dive in, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Craig Casper from New York, who uh, is definitely the uh, the leader in this. Uh, Dr. Casper, thanks for joining us. How are you? Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Well, look, I want to first thank Amit for putting this together and also for including me along with uh, all of these amazing uh, people and our colleagues who are definitely leaders in the field. And I really appreciate it. I'm gaining a lot of insight from this. For those of you who do not know me, uh, my name is Craig Casper. I've been practicing for about 23 years here in New York. About 12 of those years have been in private practice. Um, my practice is on 56th Street and Park Avenue. So we're right in the heart of New York City. Now, Here's an important disclaimer I just wanted to start with. Like all of you, uh, I do not have all of this figured out. Um, it seems like every single day, this is a minute by minute, kind of day by day decision process. Things are constantly moving and I'm having to make decisions to try to figure this all out. And it's just, it's like a game of kind of uh, shifting uh, constantly. Um, and like many of you, especially those in private practice, I'm at risk and I'm not ashamed to say this, and I'm not gonna hide this, we're all at risk for losing it all potentially. Now, I hope that that's not the case, and I don't believe that's the case, but that is a very real potential for most of us out there. Uh, just to give you an idea, I just invested in a new rotary chair because we do a lot of vestibular work in my practice that was installed in January. Um, bad timing, I guess. But just to give you guys some perspective before I jump into my topic, um, we are at the epicenter in, in the United States at this point in New York. I closed my office on Monday and it was not something that was dictated by my government whatsoever. Um, we made this decision because uh, of a number of different reasons. But what I wanted to do is just kind of use this as a little bit of a platform initially, just to let you guys know that, that we're seeing the leading edge of this wave right now. Our hospitals in New York City are becoming overwhelmed at this point. We are waiting for supplies. They're going to be putting a ship in our harbor for potential patients and overflow. Um, for those of you who are open, even part-time right now, for those of you who think that it's okay just to go outside with cups and collect hearing aids from your patients who are 80 something years old, who have lived through probably the biggest disasters on the planet to this, to this date, it's not okay. It's really important that we put aside our businesses and we really focus on humanity at this point. So I encourage you all to do that. Um, I want you to run your businesses as you see fit, but ultimately I think that what we're seeing in New York, you're going to see in your town very shortly. And I'm really sorry to, uh, to be the bearer of that, of that news. 
Um, that said, this is not going to be all doom and gloom, and that's the purpose why I'm here right now. Um, so if I had every every day, I'm making these difficult decisions, and what I want you to understand from my perspective is that uh, here are my priorities. My my patients are my priorities. My 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 business is the next priority, my team, and then I put myself last in that specific order. So when I'm looking at all the decisions I'm making, that is the specific order in which I'm looking at things, which I'm sure many of you out there are doing the exact same things. Um, with that said, uh, Amit asked me to share some thoughts uh, specifically on things that I've been working on personally for a number of years. Uh, and I'm really hopeful that as we kind of navigate through these times together, that you'll find them uh, just as valuable as you're starting to make these decisions, whether it's something, a uh, decision to close, or if it's a decision at some point in the future, how we're going to come out of this. Um, one thing that I wanted to bring to the, to, to the light, and I think that this, this goes without saying, is that if, if we're trying to become the leaders that we all envision ourselves to be, uh, a portion of ourselves has to shift from that, uh, that priority list that I just gave you to being uh, not as selfless, but focusing on self-care. Um, I can say this with with a high level of certainty. When you when Amit ran down some of the the uh, potential risk factors for those of us uh, as we're looking at patients as it relates to COVID nineteen, I've been type one diabetic for about twenty years at this point. So not only am I a provider, but I'm also a person who's in that high risk category. I have a son who has asthma. He's in a high risk category. So it's much broader than that. So I'm looking at this from a couple of <laughs> perspectives. Um, but I believe that us looking at this from a self-care perspective is the only way that we're going to make it through these unprecedented times uh, in a way that will help us to make decisions that are going to benefit as many people as possible, our patients, our business, our team, and ultimately ourselves. So with that, um, I always like to kind of look to history and science. Um, and I have just a couple of thoughts that I wanted to share with you guys. And the first thought is that leaders across time, it doesn't make a difference, uh, you know, it, it, all back in, in documented history have been known to shift their gears to find stillness for self-preservation. So stillness, what, what do I mean by that? I'll give you an example. Winston Churchill, who's arguably one of the uh, most well-known leaders uh, across history, uh, he has led through multiple world wars. He had five children. He was known to, uh, he, he's written over 10 million words, they say, in terms of documents and books. Um, he lived into his 80s. So right there, that is a product uh, or, or a perfect example of longevity, despite all of the hardship and all of the things that he went through. Uh, in the midst of all that, I want you to keep in mind, he was a painter and he was also a bricklayer. And he was known uh, during certain meetings of, of worldwide leaders, particularly one meeting in Africa, where he went off and drove for a few hours to find the perfect sunset to paint. And that was in the midst of, of some very hard global challenges that he was helping to make decisions on. So keep that in mind. That shows us that we re need very seriously to reconnect with ourselves during these times and find stillness in these times of challenge. Um, one thing that I heard years ago, and I don't remember who said this, but if you keep this in mind, um, it's, there, there's, there's a lot of things that um, uh, we can do to ultimately kind of keep our, our, our heads on straight in these times. And, you know, one other thing that I want to talk about is, is, um, is a thought too that I had is that this go, boils down to control for a lot of us. We're out of control. We've lost control in many respects. We feel like we're about to lose control. So one thing that I've been thinking a lot about is we need to control what we can and ultimately soften our death grip on the things that we cannot control, which as we're starting to realize, we have very little control over many things in our lives, mm -hmm. which me leads me to a quote. And again, if I go back into history, Viktor Frankl, who was a physician during the period right before World War II, and if, for those of you who are not familiar with Viktor Frankl, uh, he was a physician. He was thrown into the Nazi death camps during World War II, and he wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning, which is a very, very important book for many people, including myself. I read this years ago. Um, so he was really interested in looking. He was in Auschwitz, which was one of the, the more famous death camps um, uh, at the time. And he was studying what qualities essentially empowered others in the camps to want to survive versus other people who were taking their own lives by throwing themselves up against an electric fence. Um, he had a quote, and I just want to read it because it's, it's really important. And the quote that I've held close uh, every day since I read it many years ago was, 
between stimulus and response, there's a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and our freedom. I talked about this with Natalie Phillips on, on, a, on a show that we did just earlier last week, talking about this distance between stimulus and response. Why is that important? It's because our power as leaders, as people who are leading our teams, our power as, as people who are leading potentially organizations, academies, or statewide, or even our families for that matter, or even ourselves, our power lies in that space. And for most of us, that space has become very, very condensed because we're super stressed and we're making specific uh, decisions based on the stress response. So one thing that I want to do, this is, this is really important. As I talk about these two, these two leaders that have kind of blessed us with their presence throughout time is that this is truly an opportunity for us right now to gain control. It's ultimately an opportunity for us to grow, and it's ultimately an opportunity to regain our freedoms, which we feel like we're losing on a day-to-day -day basis, especially in places like New York and California and all the other states that are slowly, or some cases rapidly, starting to shut down. So there's one way for us to increase that time, and this is what I really wanted to kind of put as the exclamation point uh, on what I'm saying to you guys today, is that the, 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 the most important thing to do is to increase our awareness at these points in time. Which leads me to my, my third point, which I promise you I'm going to make this point brief, but I really want to share this with you guys because these are things that have become super helpful for me, and I know that they're going to be helpful for you guys. Um, so how do we increase our awareness and ultimately reduce the sympathetic, we're going to talk science right now, the sympathetic nervous response, which is fight or flight, and go into parasympathetic response, which is rest, digest, relax, which is so important for us in these times. So very simple things I do on a daily, daily basis. Uh, they change our physiological and our psychological state. So here we go. Let's talk science for a second. There's two things, and I rely on these two things every single day to change my state. One is our vision, and the second thing is our breathing. Now, some might argue that sound has the ability to change our physiology. We're all audiologists. We talk about this specifically as it relates to, say, tinnitus. But I'm going to push that aside for a second. We're going to focus on vision and we're going to talk about our breathing for a second. So through our eyes, there's a lot of studies that talk about stress and the fear response and ultimately how it narrows our peripheral visual field. It makes a lot of sense. When we're, when we're under fight or flight or if we're running on that savanna and we're trying to get away from the lion who's chasing us, we're laser focused on what's in front of us and we're starting to move forward. But when we're in stress, we are losing our peripheral visual field. And ultimately, you can use that as a symbolic uh, thought process for we're losing our ability to see the world globally, right? We're having to make a lot of decisions. Other studies are showing us that when we actually increase our visual field, we are increasing our parasympathetic nervous system response. So how do we do this? What we're doing every single day, especially those of us who are stuck, I'm in this room all the time now for the past week. This is my, my, war, my war room at this point. But what we're focusing on is our screens. We're focusing on our books. We're focusing on our finances. We're focusing on teleconference calls. We're focusing on our phones and the social media and all the negative stuff that's going on. If we simply just get out and we get a broader view on the world and we increase our peripheral vision, ultimately what's going to happen is our stress response is going to slow down and we're going to go into parasympathetic, parasympathetic uh, response. Um, one thing that I learned uh, a couple of years ago, uh, it's, it's almost impossible to stare at a sunset and feel stress at the exact same time. So keep that in mind as we are going through uh, these, these hard times. Second thing, and I'm gonna leave you guys with this, in just, <laughs> Craig, will you be our POTUS, please? <laughs> um, I don't know if I want that job just yet, but I appreciate the comment. Thank you. Um, um, so get outside, stare at a sunset, really important. Um, talking about breath, I've been focused on breath work for the past couple of years. I've taken a lot of courses and I've tried to kind of experiment with myself throughout the past couple of years. Breathing protocols have been around for centuries. If any of you do yoga out there, you're going to know that this, the core value or the core purpose of yoga is actual breath work. It's not about the movement per se. So it's all about the breath. One thing I'm going to encourage you guys to do, stop breathing through the mouth, breathe through the nose. We want to breathe with our diaphragm through our nose. That's going to help, again, reduce this, this sympathetic nervous system response. Here's a quick thing. First responders, Navy SEALs, professional athletes are all using breath work right now. What do they all have in common? They're making decisions in stressful situations. We are no different. We all have to make sure 
that we are treating ourselves like athletes at this period of time. So nasal breathing, diaphragm, lay down on the floor. Here's a simple thing. Flat on your back, put a hand on your chest, hand on your belly. Breathe in for a count of four. Hold for a, breath, a count of seven. Breathe out for a count of eight. Do this five, ten times, twice a day. You're going to see your nervous system again withdraw, and then ultimately what's going to happen is you're going to go into parasympathetic, parasympathetic state. The ratio of one to two, meaning four to eight, inhale to exhale, that's scientifically proven to actually increase that, that parasympathetic state. So again, here's we're going to keep it short here. With these simple strategies, get outside, do some breath work every single day. Really, really important. You're going to gain control over your stress and fear. I do this all the time. What we're going to do is we're going to become more of aware of our reactive nature, especially with all these things that are getting thrown at us. And ultimately, what we're going to do is broaden that space between stimulus and our response. And we're going to make much better decisions for all the people that are in our world right now who count on us to make those really important decisions. So again, guys, this is an opportunity. We just have to remind, us of, remind ourselves of that every single day. What's going to come next? Absolutely nobody knows. Um, but here's the difficult news, and I've been facing this. Look, the reality is the opportunity might not even be for us to practice audiology in the way that we know how to practice audiology, but that might not necessarily be a negative thing going forward. So with that, uh, I am going to leave it to you guys. If you're going to grab this opportunity for personal growth, ultimately lead the people the way we need to, uh, that's your decision. I, I think I have the answer from all the, the comments on the side here. Uh, but again, I just want to thank Amit. I want to thank everybody who's involved here. And I wish everybody luck as we kind of go through this all together. Yeah, thank you so much, Kai. That's uh, awesome information. A lot of questions and comments on the side. So that's great. Um, <clears throat> we, you know, using some of this information is, is of course, vital and, and you know, just healthy for us. So I want to move forward to uh, talking about what businesses, you know, prior practices and clinic directors Again, the financial windfall of closing your offices is significant. So what we want to do is we want to talk about some uh, potential options that you can actually use to stay afloat. So instead of me talking, I'm going to introduce Dr. Judy Hutch, who's uh, the president of Oro Valley Audiology. So I'm going to bring her on here. Do, 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 do. Hi, Judy. Uh-oh. See? I didn't unmute myself. I've been there. You are. Okay. All right. Um, one, thank you for having me too. Um, it was really hard to follow those two. Um, but uh, one, if you are feeling alone, um, please reach out. Um, we all, many of us have our own little communities, but um, some of us uh, don't. And if you don't feel like you do, please reach out and we will all do our best to try to connect you. Um, but the next step is looking financially. Um, and this changes by the hour. This is um, actually, it changes by the minute sometimes. But um, there are things that you need to look at uh, first. I mean, if you could put the OSHA link up, one thing for directors and um, owners to look at is OSHA guidelines. If uh, you have somebody who comes down with COVID-19, you do need to report to OSHA. Um, workman's compensation does change for that. Um, and I think one of the things that we need to look at is it's going to be very hard to prove in some cases where people or patients came down with COVID-19. Um, so please, CYA, document everything. Really get on your protocol for sanitation in your office. Um, those are things that you really need to look at. Um, the next part is financially securing yourself up. Um, some private practices have put, um, you know, savings aside. Some people don't. Um, some people may have had uh, that stolen from them. Um, so there are other, that's a great resource right there. Um, this uh, Society for Human Resource Management. Um, 
my friend Laurel uh, gave this uh, to me. And uh, this is a great resource for all sorts of um, information. Where I was going for one double check with your bank um, for lines of credit, um, what where you're at um, with the line of credit. Um, the Small Business Association, um, Administration, sorry, SBA, they are coming um, out with small business loans. Uh, there is low interest right now for um, corporate um, small businesses, and then there's a different uh, percentage for nonprofits. So there's something available for both. At the moment, and I have, um, I'm still updating myself on the House and Senate. And there's the disaster loan assistant. So first thing on that, and I'm sorry I'm jumping around so much. Um, I mean, thank you for keeping me in line. Um, is your state also has to declare itself a disaster area. Um, if your state has not yet, um, and you can double check what areas are there in the red, if they haven't, I urge you to send your governor um, a note. Um, some of us in Arizona did this on Wednesday. The next day it was declared a disaster area. So we were able to push through on um, on that application. There is information that you need. Um, if you don't have it, you're gonna need your EIN number. Um, you're going to need um, quite a bit of things um, lined up, but mostly your EIN. Um, and if you've been convicted, if you've ever declared bankruptcy, those types of, those are pretty general questions um, for business owners. Also have your personal finance um, up to date because your bank may need that. Even if you're a corporation, there's, um, they'll probably be asking for more secure lines of how to pay that back. Um, and and Nicole, on the small business loan, um, I don't, I don't think at the moment that it is only for people who have not um, laid people off. I think that there's going to be a different set of rules for people who have not laid people off, and that is something that we all have to keep in mind for people who have already laid people off. It's um, it's kind of after the fact. I think it only goes back to March 1st. Um, so I think that the rules might be different at the moment between the House and the Senate bills. The last that I've read, they're a little bit different. The House side is a little bit more friendly for employees. The Senate side is a little bit more friendly for um, employers. And so how they're gonna bring that together is, um, is what we're really watching. Um, there, if their business is 500 employees or less, that's kind of right now where the tipping point is 500 or less. So we all, most of us fall under that 500 or less. Um, the House side is saying that we would have to give two weeks of um, sick leave if there is a COVID-19 connection that somebody has to stay home. But the Senate side does not say that. Um, and it's 50 or less, there's a little bit more of the protections there. So these are moving targets right now. I wish I could say that there's absolute um, answers, and there is not. Um, the president did come out that there's relaxing rules for Medicaid reporting. Uh, these are things that I think will be coming out more. Um, 
So do what you need to do now. Um, if your business doesn't survive, then those people don't have jobs to come back to. If you have to lay off, then please help them um, with unemployment. Arizona, there's different wording that we have to use. Like, um, I moved everybody over to hourly for those that were salaried. So um, we can still pay for the hours that they work. If they were salaried, it was kind of an all or nothing. Um, ADP is my payroll. I am going to them for answers as well as um, my cooperative group that I'm in. Um, we don't know, you're right, Joan, none of these have passed um, at the moment. This is um, talk and how they're trying to move it through. Um, but how are employers going to help their employees? There are places that I know who had to close their doors and they had to lay everybody off pretty much immediately, um, but they are working with to keep covering healthcare um, because that was one of the employee's major concerns. Um, please go to your employers as, what can I do to help? Um, and employers, please go to your employees. You know, how can I help you? And this is what I can control. And this is what I'm thinking of right now. That communication just has to be there. Um, and I'm on both sides of the coin. I owe money to people and people owe me. Um, what I highly suggest is that we start the conversation is, how can we frame this as a win-win situation for both of us? Um, don't go to your manufacturers and say, I can't pay. Um, you know, that's it. Um, they're in trouble too. Uh, we're all struggling. So how can we frame these conversations in how can we help each other? And there are some things that we can control right now um, and some things we are not able to. So let's just, um, my favorite word is grace. Um, I don't always show grace. I try to show grace. Um, but Emily, you're right. There are incentives to not lay people off. Are we able to cut hours? Um, and really keeping up on um, reading what's out there and going to our accountants and um, our lawyers and how to make it so it's understandable. I am not a numbers person um, and I am shooting emails off to my accountant left and right and I'll be talking to him tomorrow. Um, so nobody has the answers. I'm gonna run, run off with from Craig. None of us have the answers, but my gosh, we're just um, trying to keep up. And as leaders, uh, we do have to make those hard decisions. Um, it, it has been excruciating for me to make um, some decisions because I've been waiting for somebody else to make them for me. So, so it's easier. But at the end of the day, I have to do it. I'm the leader. Um, and my patients were not making good health decisions. Um, they were walking in my office. They had masks, but they didn't cover their nose. Um, so I had to make that decision for them. I am having to make the decision um, for my employees. It is all going to ride on me. And that's the way it's going to be. But I also have a beautiful community um, to help me. So... Um, what are some other, um, what a, yes, Jane, later today, they're still hashing out the details. I did get something sent to me, um, and some of the 
like Rand Paul, he was just a diagnosed positive. So I don't know how they're going to end up working um, the Senate. But there are, uh, Rubio has sent something out to keep workers paid an employment act. So that's something on this um, Senate side to look at, um, keeping workers paid an employment act. And um, I don't have the name in front of me on the House side. But, um, and Christy, I'm locking the door. That's how patients aren't coming in. You lock the door and you make them call you. Um, that's my suggestion. I love it. Uh, actually, that's that's uh, good advice. In fact, uh, one of the things you you touched on, which is really important, is that a lot of our patients don't understand the, you know, they're not on Facebook like we are all on Facebook, and we're all sharing ideas and and really absorbing a lot of the content from our government officials. Some of them just feel like, ah, the good Lord's going to take me when the good Lord takes me, right? So they're going to show up anyways. So it is incumbent upon us as healthcare providers to to lock our doors, like you mentioned. Judy. Thank you so much, Judy. All right. Uh, let's see here. So, <clears throat> you know, uh, as, as you guys have been hearing from all of our uh, colleagues here, the, it, it's not a it's not a small thing. It's a, it's a big issue. Uh, one of the last topics that we want to bring up is things that you can be doing with our communities at this time, because it's not just us that are suffering. There are local businesses. There are other folks out there that are um, are suffering as well. So for that, I'm going to bring on Dr. Natalie Phillips, and let's see if I can do this as well. I think I can. Can I? I can. Nope. There. Yep. There you are. Hello. Hello. Thank you for having me. All right. So you know, this kind of you, we've been we've been hearing from such wonderful people, and Amit, thank you again for putting this all together because it's something that we're all living through, and it's such uncharted territory that it's you know we've all got to kind of band together and make sure that we can all support each other. But the biggest thing that I was excited to talk about today today was to not forget to look out. So. I did a little bit of research and I found out that the New York Times just reported on Tuesday that some of the industries that are at the most risk of financial loss include restaurants and bars, and you've seen it on the news, right? So restaurants and bars, hotels and lodging, um, performing arts, sports, I know this, and museums, air transportation, amusement, gambling, and recreation. So I know a lot of us are like, oh my gosh, what do we do with no sports? Um, but I'm here to say, you know, don't forget to pour back into the economy. So there are certain things that we were doing, um, purchasing staff uh, lunches from small business restaurants. You know, there are lots of different ideas that I'm seeing. I was seeing um, just kind of looking at different ways that people are pivoting and being a little more creative. And that's what I want to inspire people to do is, you know, this, this is what it is. And so we've got to get out there and use our technology. And all of us, because we're audiologists, we're good at technology. All we have to do is figure it out. And I've had so many people help me figure out technology. And so I want to put it out there that if you need help, you know, ask some of us. I know Mitt did an excellent job with the StreamYard platform. Um, but some of the other things that I'm seeing too is don't forget to, you know, in order for us to come back from this, we're going to have to pour back into the economy when we can. I know people are like, yeah, but what am I doing? Because if I'm not working, I'm not making the money. And, um, you know, there's two kinds of people that I want to focus on. Some of the people that are losing their jobs and are clearly not in a position to spend money. And then the other types of people are who continue to have their jobs and, you know, um, might come back from this. Right. And so a lot of the times I know we forget about that, but I've been seeing a lot of really cool ways that people are pouring back into each other. Um, my neighborhood apps I've been noticing and my neighborhood Facebook groups, um, they've been posting, you know, I've got extra toilet paper. I've got extra this. Can I run to the store for you? Is there somebody that is a shut in or an elderly person that might need that help? So I want to remind people not to forget to do that as well. Um, Share to support the arts. I know um, Becky Kazmarski, um, sh her sons did a uh, did a concert online and raised money. And my kids in about mm, 40 minutes are going to do a concert as well online to support the performing arts. So there's all these different things that you can do, all these things that people can, what I call pivot and get 
creative to help support and use our technology that we have. Schools start next week. We're on spring break, but they're going to start week. They've pivoted. They're all going to go to online, right, to Zoom calls, things like that. And so, um, you know, thinking about there was a question earlier, too, as well, that somebody had put up that talked about, you know, what do we do now? We got to go to social media marketing. And so a lot of the things that I wanted to talk about, too, is what does social media marketing mean? And so what it means is basically what we're doing here. Show up. It's time to show up. It's time to show off your culture of your office, whether you're open or you're closed, the reasoning behind it, you know, come online and talk to your patients, talk to your followers, talk to your colleagues. Um, there's so many ways to get on video uh, to show up for your patients. Amit had said, or somebody had said something about, you know, um, doing videos now to, to show how to clean your hearing aids. Come online and, you know, we're doing all where we have classes that were on the, um, you know, where we got people together. You can do listening strategies, communication strategies on a Zoom call. Come online on Facebook Live from your office and do it. Put it up on YouTube for people who are not on Facebook. Get to your email marketing list and do a really quick video. It doesn't have to be live. Send it out by email marketing. You know, there's so many things that we can do. Assistive listening devices, connectivity, except for David DeCreek, probably won't do a video on connectivity, but there's so many topics to do this. And so, you know, we'd also talked, I know Gail had talked about fourth year interns, right? Get those fourth year interns learning about business and doing some marketing. They probably have some great ideas. So, you know, there's so many things that we can be doing. Don't forget to pour into the economy. It doesn't have to cost money either. Some of the ways that you can pour back into the economy and to small businesses are writing Facebook reviews, writing Yelp reviews, things like that. Um, don't forget about that. Maybe buying gift cards if you want to. I know not all financial, but there are all those different options. So with that, I wanted to remind people to look out, to look out from our industry. Yes, we are always looking in. We're always supporting each other, but also don't forget to look out to these small businesses. If we are all going to come back from this, then we all have to support the economy and keep it going. So that was my two cents. And I'm going to have Amit take it away. Okay, I think I'm back on. <laughs> so thank you so much for that. Uh, somebody asked if you would link your uh, your kids' concert uh, somewhere. So oh, it's on my. It'll be on my Facebook page. Yeah. Perfect. All right. So <clears throat> let's make sure I do this right. There we go. So we've gone over. Uh, it's been well over an hour, almost an hour and a half here, but we do want to. We, we do want to give you the opportunity for some Q and A. I for, first thing is we're going to apologize ahead of time. We're we're not going to get every question, and and we're sorry about that. We also don't have a crystal ball. Uh, we don't have all the answers, as a couple of people have mentioned. We do have some resources that we can help guide you up in the description of this Facebook Live. I've included a few links that are there, including the CDC, the World Health Organization, um, uh, ADA, AAA. Uh, the OSHA, uh, I believe the OSHA that Judy was talking about is on there, uh, a couple other links. So feel free to uh, visit those. Um, we're not audio, you know, we are audiologists. We're not infectious disease specialists. So we appreciate you guys being here and listening and and uh, uh, hopefully you learn something. Uh, I think Q&A, why don't we go like 10 minutes or so if we even need it? Uh, if we don't need 10 minutes, that's fine. I do want to thank uh, ADA again for uh, their uh, uh, forward thinking uh, 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 things. And uh, they have that town hall. Again, I will, uh, if I can do this quickly enough, uh, they do have a uh, town hall tomorrow. You can actually visit uh, audiologist.org. There's information there about the town hall. It is a town hall. Kim Cavett, uh, well respected, knows a lot about this stuff, is going to be on there talking about many different topics. And it is, again, open to all audiologists, not just ADA members. Uh, we want to thank AAA again. They do have those videos that are coming out. You can visit their uh, YouTube channel. Uh, and, and of course, if you're following them on social media. Uh, I, I do, before uh, we get too far, I do want to thank everyone that was on the live. Uh, Dr. Spankovich, uh, Judy, Dr. Uh, Dr. Hutch, Dr. Casper, Dr. Whitelaw, Dr. Phillips, and Dr. Abel and Dr. Kazmarski are on. They're actually in what we call our green room. Uh, they are sitting here very quietly. Um, uh, we. Uh, uh, they, they'll be available for Q&A right now. Uh, so thank you guys for all being on. And uh, I think we're going to open it up to Q&A here. And at a certain point, I am going to turn that off. So uh, go shoot.
I'm going to throw some of you back on that were uh, speakers. Amit, this was a great thing. I really appreciate you putting this together for all of us. Absolutely. Thank you. I see a lot of people on, and I don't see any I know there's uh, a lot of questions. Coming. Questions. I don't know if you can post there are. it or not. Um, I'm trying to read them too sure. at the same time. One question I'll just start here that I noticed is somebody asked, are people uh, trying for their some different? Uh, I'm trying to read that question as well. So I don't know if we want to talk about that one too. I just saw it come in. Um, are people ch charging for telehealth? My preference, if um, if I go that route too, is if people are underneath under their um, warranty status, I usually will not charge for telehealth options. I don't know um, anybody else wants to tackle that. Um, at times, it's just something that I would consider part of my bundled services. I just added Deb Abel back in. I know she's muted, but AAA just sent a letter out to CMS. I, I, I don't know if ADA was involved in that or not, and maybe she can answer that if she's still on. Uh, but they did send a letter to uh, the, the U.S. government and CMS about including telehealth as a billable uh, thing. I mean, it's Deb. Um, I can take a second to respond to that. Um, sure. I think uh, Natalie's right. You know, if you have done itemized billing for hearing aids, um, you certainly could continue to do that if you're providing those services via telehealth. In terms of diagnostics, um, I would be very careful at this point in time, especially with Medicare, because we haven't heard anything about them loosening things at this point in time for us. At this point, Medicare does not recognize audiologists to provide diagnostic services via telehealth. So until we hear otherwise and something definite, I'd be very concerned about how you use those services um, in terms of diagnostics. If you're doing treatment, which Medicare doesn't cover, so let's go back to you know um, the tinnitus patient who you are seeing and needs you as their lifeline right now. Um, you know that's a service you may be able to provide via telehealth. I'll also tell you um, at this point, and Kim will talk about this tomorrow on our town hall, um, the government is relaxing some methodologies on how you can communicate with patients that were not classified as HIPAA compliant. So if you want to contact a patient or they you through FaceTime or Skype or something like that, you may have that opportunity um, to work with them. So. Um, I think tomorrow, Kim, will be very helpful for talking about those kinds of services um, in terms of HIPAA and the relaxation of what we can and can't do. The other thing I think has been brilliant this week um, is several of the office management systems have included a telehealth option. So you will be able to do a lot of things from a hearing aid standpoint through your telehealth office management system. So ask them. They're there to help you. So I think those are all things that can keep you up and running. That's great. And and somebody made a good comment that if you are bundled, then you know that's that's a different story. Um I, I, I'm gonna try very hard to keep up with all these questions. Some of the comments are coming in related to questions, but uh Melissa Collard asked, AAA is recommending closing, but it is just that, just a recommendation. Uh and we should follow the local, state, and then nationwide recommendations, correct? I have some thoughts on that. And, uh, you know, look, I, I think that, again, we're all, we were kind of, as a group, we were kind of chatting about this earlier today. Look, we're all concerned with self-preservation right now of our, our practices. We want to make sure that we're there to serve patients and that we all have jobs and businesses to go back to. I think it's really, really important to keep in mind right now, the most important thing right now is public health. There's, there's no second thing right here. I'm sorry. Like, I, I hate to break that news to people. I had to make a very hard decision. In New York City, we have probably some of the highest overhead uh, than anyone across the country. If I made that decision, I think it's really important for you guys to make that decision too. And I'm not telling you how to, try, to run your businesses. I am, I'm not that person. I can only say from a humanitarian standpoint, 
if that's the right word. If that, if from that standpoint, we have to play our part in making sure that this, this virus does not continue to spread, especially with the populations that we're dealing with. It's doing a disservice. And ultimately, I wonder if it's actually opening us up for liability in the future. Thank you, Craig. And by the way, guys, uh, just so you know, you're only seeing six people because I can only allow six people at a time. So Dr. Spankovich and Dr. Kazmarski are there patiently uh, in the green room. So if you have any specific questions for them, please post. Uh, the other question that was here was, what CPT code would you consider using for telehealth if it was billable? Are there any insurance companies that may cover it at all? I guess that's sort of me. <laughs> so um, if you are doing diagnostics, again, you wanna be very careful um, if, if, you, if it's with a third party that will recognize um, you providing those services via telehealth. You certainly want to change your place of service. So instead of having 11 for your office, you're going to want to change it to zero two um, for it to be um, billed telehealth. Again, I check with your payer first to make sure they'll recognize audiologists for that service before you go ahead and do anything. Excellent. Um, yeah, I think these are good comments. Hey, Masa, uh, this is a good one. Uh, it is about social responsibility. Uh, another one here from Teresa, public health safety is more important than money without the public uh, that cut off. Um, we definitely don't want to be spreading it to staff. Uh, here's a question from Joan. How many of us had super inappropriate patients and families come in last week? It was freaky. Uh, I'm going to just leave that one alone. Um, <laughs> I know that uh, there were some questions about the, 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 the drug itself, and I just noticed that Chris has stepped away from the camera. Um, but if there are any questions about that, let me know. I can, I can always kick someone off the screen here and and uh, and throw a, uh, put Chris back up. And uh, Becky, you just raise your hand if you have any comments, I'll put you on as well. Oh, good, okay, so uh, Laurel asked, uh, there were some questions earlier about Lyric patients. Uh, I don't do Lyric, so I will uh, defer to anybody else here. Perfect. Uh, Laurel, I apologize. I think uh, with the, uh, at some point we had over 350 people here. Hopefully uh, somebody can answer that question. Um, I think Phonak had sent an email out to all of the providers doing it earlier today. And so I I would kick that back to, to Phonak um, because there's so many people who aren't doing that um, anymore and they are special circumstances so i would encourage you to reach out to them asap perfect um whoops i'm sorry i'm sorry uh alex you had something there uh let me see if i can get that back up here do, 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 do. Oh, there we go how long are you closed or how long are you rescheduling your patients out to I guess that's a question for just a couple of us, right? Um, yeah. So, Deb, I'm gonna I'm gonna put take you off, and Becky, I'm gonna put you on here. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just decided yesterday to close, so I don't know the answer to that. But I'm thinking 30 days, and then when we do talk with patients, to let them know we're gonna call again and keep them updated, so it's not just a final thing. We'll definitely. Um, uh, keep in touch with them in every way, manner possible. Possible. Yeah, we're uh, we're closed uh, at this point. Uh, we don't have a definitive date uh, at this point in New York. I think that if we're really looking at the statistics and the science, we're just kind of on the upswing in New York with what's going to happen with cases. Um, some of our colleagues are are very optimistic, saying that they will be open on March thirtieth. I think that's being massively optimistic. I'd like to say that that's the case. I'm not a pessimist by nature, but I am definitely a realist. 
Um, we're evaluating on a day by day, week by week basis at this point. I think the most important thing for anybody in practice is just maintaining contact with your patients and allowing them the opportunity to communicate with you when they need to, whether that's telephone, telehealth, um, you know, we're just emailing patients. We're, we're doing whatever we can just to keep contact with people. Um, I would like to add, cause uh, we do disability testing, um, and uh, at the moment, I have not seen anything. It has to come from the VA, the top of the VA, to stop um, these appointments. It cannot come from QTC or VES. And um, so I would encourage you um, to contact your senators and representatives um, to contact uh, the head of the VA to suspend services at the moment. I have heard it's just regionally with the VAs right now. I know in Tucson, um, they're starting to be a little bit more of a lockdown because there was a COVID case um, here in Tucson. Um, but your QTC and VES, they're gonna keep calling you because they don't have guidance from the VA right now. Um, so, please reach out so the VA will make that call. And what I'm doing at the moment is I'm not seeing patients next week. So we canceled all of our, um, all of our appointments through QTC. So then their claims, the clock stopped on the claim because it came from us. Uh, this is very important for your vets because what they're concerned about is that the clock is still ticking on their claim. Um, and so we're still making appointments down the road three weeks down, even though they don't like it, but nobody else is taking, um, taking the appointments either. So each week then we'll cancel and kick the can down the road. Um, but that's, the only way that I have figured out to protect our vets claims and protect them to not feel that they have to be, they have to come in to see us because QTC, VES, those, they are not going to make this call right now until the VA does. Right. I want to, I want to uh, change the subject back to the uh, town hall. Paul Dabala actually posted, I, I know I'm sharing, I'm showing you the link. You can't click on it, but in the comments there, you can see Paul actually, uh, Put the link there. Uh, Deb, do you have anything to say about that or can I move on on that? No, thank you, uh, Paul, for doing that. Um, and so, like you said, Amit, it's for any audiologist and you know it's a good time to, to be a community. So I would really encourage you. It's only supposed to be an hour, one o'clock um, tomorrow afternoon, Eastern time. So um, please work that in your schedule. And if things work out, we were only supposed to be on for 45 minutes as well. So I'm sure it'll go past an hour, um, which is great because Kim is a great uh, speaker. So uh, Stephanie asked, what about those of us required to come to work at ENT offices? Am I still on? Yeah, uh, probably um, what I would recommend then is using your city and state guidelines and really providing that to the HR or the owner of that practice. And if your city and state is or county are saying that, hey, you are not an essential provider and you should not be going to work, then that's probably something that you need to provide them. But again, I, I would 100% defer to your local government officials on that. uh let's see here i'm behind here um someone said their state dentists have been closed until may 18th qtc uh christina michelle said qtc told uh told her it's up to the provider mm. Here's another, uh, thank you, Ram Nileshwar, uh, the ADA Town Hall. Again, that's, it's a long link to copy down. So if you're gonna write it down, I'll leave it up just for a moment. Let's 
CI providers, Joan, I, uh, I'll, I'll click on your question. Any CI providers and maybe some uh, information on that. If people have info, they can share it. Uh, Dallas County just announced a shelter in place. So that's Texas. Um, here's one from Masa, who's in Toronto. Uh, if anyone hasn't done this already, call the manufacturers and request extensions for account payment terms. Some of them have been very lovely to agree, others not so much, but it never hurts to ask. Yeah, and, one, thing, uh, one thing I found with that along those lines, Ahmed, is that, uh, again, just echoing what comments were made earlier, if we're communicating and we're just open with the manufacturers, we want to work together because all of us want to be here when this is all done. And in my experience with the manufacturers, a lot of them have been very uh, agreeable and uh, and pleasant to deal with because I've approached it that way. Uh, right. So I think it was Judy who said earlier, just you know, have a human conversation with your manufacturer partners, and they'll probably be very kind to you in the uh, in the in the in the uh, in light of what's going on right now. <laughs> no, not so much. <laughs> I mean, she asked if I was in my bathroom. I'm in my Granville Bands hoodie. <laughs> it <was> the weekend. <laughs> uh, sounds like the VA just canceled most medical pr procedures by uh, Teresa Huber. Just made that comment here. Uh, as much as we can, Laurel. Uh, AAA's uh, message is not legally binding. Um, can I pop one up on here just for some, some humor? What do you, yeah, go for it. I don't know what you're doing. Let's see, can I, I don't know if I could pop up comments here. No, it's not let me do it. No, only I can do it. Yeah, Doug Beck put something up. He said, Natalie, always a wonderful and thoughtful presentation. Your energy and enthusiasm are contagious. Good job. I, I had that up earlier, actually. <laughs> I did have that up, actually. Uh, so I think um, hopefully we've touched on most of these uh, questions. I know that there's a, uh, the president was just on and I know people want to get back to their lives and, and sit on the couch. So, uh, uh, you know, again, thank you guys for joining us. Hopefully this was helpful. I will do my best to upload this, uh, whether it's on Facebook, it'll definitely go up on YouTube. Um, and, I'll, and I'll do my best to get it captioned. Uh, Natalie, uh, Dr. Phillips is gonna help me with that. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, for being voluntold to do that. Um, the uh, uh, And uh, Chris, I know, I, I'm sorry, I had you off there for a while. Do you have any uh, comments besides what's been said already? Oh. Oh, yeah. All right, there I am. Uh, yeah, so uh, I would just say that, you know, everything I presented is really a big if. So we don't know if this agent is going to be something that moves forward at all. Um, again, it's a wait and see type of thing before we start to actually put together any type of um, AAA, ASHA, ADA recommended, recommended um, uh, a draft of a, a statement or something like that. that. That's a long ways off. So let's just wait to see how things progress. And hopefully, even if it's not something that's quinine um, derived, uh, uh, maybe hopefully something will come out in the next six months or so that um, – will be something that can help mitigate these symptoms. Perfect, thank you so much. And thanks to all of you. I mean, uh, you know, it, this is not a one, you know, people are posting about the unity here. It's, it's great. I think the reality is we're all humans and uh, we're all looking for an answer. So uh, thank you guys. If there's any further questions, you can still comment, I believe. I don't know where Natalie, Natalie's uh, logged off, but uh, if you keep commenting, I think we'll do our best to uh, uh, try to answer those questions as best we can. Uh, one more time, um, please refer to your government officials, AAA, ADA, other uh, resources besides us, CDC, uh, and of course, WHO. Uh, with that, uh, I think I'm going to sign off. Uh, uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us, and uh, we be safe, and we'll talk to you guys later.